Oh, okay. Uh, good morning again. The uh, second case that we'll hear today is GNP Railway, Inc., Acquisition and Operation Exemption, Redmond Spur and Woodenville Subdivision Docket Number, Finance Docket Number 35407. This case centers around the proposal by GNP Railway to acquire the right to restore rail service over two segments of railroad right-of-way that are currently reserved for recreational trail. GMP is asking the board to vacate the notice of interim trail use it issued for these segments so the carrier can serve freight customers. King County, Washington, the trail sponsor in the city of Redmond, Washington, opposed the request, saying that GMP does not own the right-of-way or have any other contractual rights to it, and so is not in a position to resume rail service. Um, I guess in, in an effort to move things along, Council, were you here for the earlier instructions in the prior case? Both, all Council, so I'll skip that. Um, each side has been allotted 20 minutes. GMP will open and has requested 15 minutes on opening. King County and the City of Redmond have requested 10 minutes each for a total of 20 minutes, and GMP has reserved five minutes for rebuttal. If you wish to make a change to your reserve rebuttal time or your allotted time, please advise us when you begin your opening presentation. We will now proceed, Council for GMP, st please step up to the podium, introduce yourself, indicate if you wish to change your time for rebuttal, and then begin. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Elliott and members of the board, uh, my name is John Hefner, and I appear on behalf of GMP. And as you have said, you have indicated, I will speak for 15 minutes. My colleague, Jim Savage, will handle the rebuttal for five. And we have two representatives of GMP here today. Uh, on my left is Tom Payne, who is the chairman, and right behind me, over to the left, uh, we have Tom Jones. This proceeding presents an issue of first impression. It's whether the board must approve an authorized, excuse me, a request by an authorized rail carrier to restore to active common carrier rail service a line that has been converted to trails use under the National Trails Act and the board's implementing regulations where the petitioning carrier does not own the right-of-way or have the common carrier uh, rights to restart the service, what I call the restart rights. Now, just as a point of uh, clarification, the rail line in question actually looks kind of like an upside-down wishbone. There is a segment that begins on the very north, that's Nahomish, and it proceed, proceeds south for about, I would say, 15 miles to a place called Woodenville. And Woodenville, there's a junction, and that segment is called the freight segment. And GNP can and does operate a, a typical short line common carrier rail freight service. At Woodenville, the line splits. There is a two mile stub, which is one of the two lines in question here. And below that, two-mile segment, that is not relevant for the purpose of our proceeding. The line does continue south in a mixture of abandoned and rail trail and, at the very end, active railroading. Then there is the Redmond segment that proceeds from Woodenville in kind of a southeasterly direction for seven miles to the city of Redmond. So that's just for clarification. So what we're talking about then is this little piece that's almost like the, uh, the heel of your shoe and then in effect, the sole of the shoe heading over to Redmond. Now, both King County and Redmond acknowledge that the lines are eligible for reactivation as common carrier railroads, but in their terms, this is not the time or the circumstances. And King County even goes too far as to say that it would um, fulfill its obligations as a rail trail sponsor and even allow the reactivation of rail service in the event a reasonable proposal is advanced to restore rail service. That's right in their January 7th reply at page 2. But King County does not specify a standard and does not even have any experience for judging rail service proposals. They say jump, but they don't indicate how high. And the person who is the project manager uh, for the uh, city of Redmond, excuse me, for King County, says, we don't do rail. As the board ruled in an earlier proceeding involving the King County acquisition of the BNSF 
common carrier obligation and restart rights, and the it was the acquisition of BNSF's common carrier obligation, and forcefully reiterated more recently in the city of Maplewood case, the right to reactivate a rail bank line is not an exclusive right and would not preclude any other service provider from seeking board authorization to restore rail service over a rail bank line if the county chose not to do so. Now, you must read or you should read the King County case in the context in which it happened, and there was another group, which I think was called All Aboard Washington, that ran some sort of a tourist service, and they were very concerned that there was kind of an inherent conflict if King County had both the common carrier restart rights and was also the rail trail sponsor or provider. Well, did we get it wrong back in 2009 when we transferred the rights to the trail sponsor? Was that a mistake, or should we have kept the rights with the abandoning railroad as is normally done? I don't have a problem with the King County case if the board lives up to what it said in the decision, and the board was very clear. The board said, regardless of the party's intentions, a bona fide petitioner under appropriate circumstances may request that the NITU be vacated to permit a reactivation of the line for continued service. So I think the board was faced with this apparent conflict raised by All Aboard Washington, and the board dealt with it in an appropriate fashion. Well, that's the question of bona fide. What represents it? Who constitutes a bona fide applicant? Under what statutory provision would the board have the power to force the owner of a rail bank rail line, in this case King County, to let another party with no property rights on the line to use its property since we assign the property to King County? What's our statutory authority? We have cases where we can do that, but it's not an OFA situation, nor is it a feeder line situation. So those are the cases where we normally would do that. So what's our authority to do this? Frankly, there is kind of a vacuum, so to speak. And I agree with you. It's ambiguous. And, in fact, so I'm not sure what the authority is. On the one hand, there's no authority for it. On the other hand, there's nothing to say you can't do it. It's a totally gray area, which I'm sure is the reason why we're having this oral argument today. But I would point out to you that the rights and obligations, the right that was conveyed to King County and the obligation to honor a restart request go together. And, in fact, if you look at the various agreements between the parties and you look at the King County decision, that is that roughly 2009 decision, you'll see that the board understood that these rights and obligations go together as a package. Now, I would mention that while one of the agreements, the agreement between the Port of Seattle, and don't forget that while King County has a trail easement, a non-exclusive trail easement, and they have the restart rights, they don't actually own the right-of-way. There are several miles into Redmond that is owned by the city of Redmond, but the rest of the right-of-way is owned by King County. So the, excuse me, I'm sorry, by the Port of Seattle. And when I use the term port, I mean the Port of Seattle. The agreement between the port and the GNP would, on the surface, limit GNP's activities over what I'll call the rail bank segments to excursion service, not to common carrier freight service. But there's nothing in the agreement that would preclude GNP from reactivating that as an active rail line. And, in fact, there was a conversation between Tom Payne and the lady who is the general counsel for the port where they had this very conversation. Suppose I want to reactivate, and basically what she said is, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and file. So, again, it's kind of gray area. But the board has to operate in a fashion that spells out clear policies for people, and that's kind of the dilemma. Now, there are two points. Let me ask you a question. I was reading through the filing by King County, and I noticed on, I guess it was 
page 19 of their confidential version, I don't think I'm speaking about anything that's confidential, that there is a limitation on GMP to operate freight service. I mean, at this point, if there is a limitation for GMP to operate freight service on the lines at issue, aren't we done? We're not done because GMP can always seek to reactivate. They are limited, they are precluded so long as it's in a rail trail status. But I don't believe there's anything in that agreement that says they can't file. Don't you have a contract with the city of Edmond that prohibits you providing freight rail service? I know that the arrangement with the city of Redmond contemplates an excursion service to mile post, I believe it's two and a half on the seven mile line. So you wouldn't think it would be a breach of the contract if you were to try and introduce a freight rail service? Again, in the context of a reactivation. Would that be more appropriate for a state court, that question? And in fact, this case poses a lot of contract questions, contract interpretation questions that are exactly appropriate for interpretation before a state court. I could not agree more with you, Mr. Chairman. There are two things that we do agree with our adversaries on. They say that the line can be restored to service at any time, and we agree with that. But the question is whether King County and Redmond should be allowed to be the gatekeepers, so to speak. And if they are, they really make a potential mockery of what the whole rail trail program is about, because it would always be possible for the trail user, or perhaps even the trail owner, to put a stop to the reactivation of rail service unless the carrier desiring to reactivate had gotten that right from the abandoning carrier or had negotiated a contractual right with the rail line, the right-of-way owner, or perhaps the rail trail party. Now, the second thing which I want to emphasize, and I really want to emphasize, is that board acquisition and operation authority is permissive. The board does not create property rights that don't exist. They leave it to the parties to obtain property rights, and we're perfectly happy to do that. The board authorizes operations, and that's all. Now, I just sort of throw out to you the issue. Suppose that a shipper, suppose that there were no GNP at all, no railroad. Well, let me ask you about that, since you say whether or not there's a GNP at all. Our understanding through looking through some court documents is that GNP presently is in an involuntary bankruptcy proceeding. Is that correct? No, sir. And my colleague, Mr. Savage, will address this at more length. GNP is the subject of an involuntary bankruptcy filing, a petition. It has not been adjudicated a bankrupt as yet. I anticipate there will be financing that will come through within a matter of days, and if this happens, we will want to make a supplemental submission with the board's permission that will take it out of bankruptcy, or excuse me, that will eliminate even the prospect of a bankruptcy. The bankruptcy, now that you bring it up as an issue, was filed by three parties initially at the instigation of a former shareholder, corporate officer, director, who incidentally has been terminated. That individual is no longer affiliated with the company? Well, he's still a shareholder, but he's no longer an officer. What's his percentage? I believe it's 50 percent, if I'm not mistaken. So doesn't that almost make him a necessary party? I don't know that he's a necessary party to this proceeding. He's been terminated in his role as an officer. Can the company actually do this transaction without that person's okay? I believe it can, and the reason is, while it is my understanding that 4,000 shares of stock have been issued, there are 10,000 that are authorized to be issued. And there is, and Mr. Jones does wish to purchase stock in the company. But I must tell you, of the three petitioning bankruptcy creditors, one of them is only entitled to compensation when the company gets its full financing. 
So their claim is really a contingent claim. Of the other two who are involved, neither of them has a written contract that indicates or specifies their right to compensation. And a couple of the other creditors who have come into the picture since then are family members of the individual who was fired. How would the company make a determination of whether or not to go forward? I mean, I assume there's some type of corporate documents that set forth procedures when there's dispute. What is the procedure? I'm sure there are. I cannot, because I do not handle their corporate work, you can understand that I cannot address that. But if it's something that you wish us to address in a supplemental filing, we'd be happy to do that. You've identified some shippers on the line that there would be shippers. Are these shippers definitely going to ship, or have they just speculated that they might ship if indeed service was restored? I would like to say they're definitely going to ship. I'm not going to tell you that we have written contracts or commitments of that level. They have been past shippers on BNSF, and they currently use motor carrier service, and they have expressed an interest in using rail instead. So we anticipate they would. In addition, I want to emphasize in terms of what I'll call the book of business, most short lines do not start out with a full book of business on day one, and we're no different. And in fact, the level of freight on the freight easement has doubled over the past year, and my client advises it's likely to double again over the next year. Now, I just want to hit a couple of things remaining. Suppose that a shipper were to call up King County and say, we've got 10 carloads of freight coming from Idaho. What would happen? I realize that I'm out of time, and if you wish, I can either Mr. Savage or I can address some of these other points. I can ask you a question that might allow you to complete the thought. Usually, very often, we'll see a municipality once rail service. Yes, sir. And now here's a situation where we have a trail, a rail bank trail. There's a desire on the part of this company, which is not the one that abandoned the line, but to restore, reactivate service, and the county and the city of Edmond are opposed to it. What is the rationale? What do you understand to be, and I'll ask this question also of the other parties, the rationale for not wanting to restore rail service at this point? I think what happened, Commissioner Mulvey, is that the communities involved maybe didn't do that thorough due diligence. I think there might have been an element that BNSF wanted to discourage some of the shipping, so that depressed the levels of traffic. And then there was a very complicated financing arrangement where the port and other parties did a combination purchase and receipt of a donation from BNSF. And my understanding is that some of the financing may have fallen apart on the public acquisition with the result that the port was then anxious to spin some segments off as quickly as possible. So that, I'm getting a little bit beyond my knowledge level, but that's what I think really drove them to get rid of some segments as quickly as possible. It's kind of a hot potato. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from counsel for King County. Please step up, introduce yourself for the record, and begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, Commissioner Mulvey. My name is Charles Spitolnik, and I represent King County in this proceeding. And I'm joined this morning at the council table by my colleague, Eric Pilsk. The board has asked the parties to address one specific question, and the counsel for GNP has raised a number of issues that I will address in a moment as soon as I answer the specific question that the board asked. The board's question, as Commissioner Mulvey indicated previously, was under what circumstances should the board permit a carrier to permit the vacation of a NITU, that is a notice of interim trail use, when the petitioning carrier does not own or have any other interest in the right-of-way. And King County's answer to that question unequivocally is under no circumstances. Before you get into the nitty-gritty of that, just going back to my earlier question, Mr. Hefner, after reading through your submission, I did read regarding the license prohibiting them, GNP, from providing any freight service on the line. Is it the party's position 
uh, King County's position that that flat out um, would end this dispute. That okay. That, that's and then um, I mean it, it 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 appears to be a fairly unambiguous uh, provision that says. Um, have no right to operate other common carrier contract freight rail service on the excursion spur. It's rather difficult to imagine a more clearer statement of the limitation on GNP's inability to operate freight service on that line than the provision that they agreed to in that agreement. And Thank one, you. one of the points that Mr. Hefner uh, referred to in his opening comments was that there are a number of issues like that one that would need to be resolved in the state court because, as you might suspect, we disagree with uh, GNP's interpretation of the agreement and might want to take that to state court. And the similar issue with respect to property rights, all of those things could be resolved in state court, and those issues should be resolved before the GNP brings any matter to this board asking for reactivation of, of rail rights. GNP has no property rights. If they wish to try to force their way onto the line, try to force acquisition of the property rights, that's a matter for state court, not for this board. As, as you all indicated previously, there's no provision of the statute that permits the board in this context to award property rights to a carrier that doesn't already have them. This is not an OFA. This is not an Amtrak case. This is not a proceeding where the, where the board has the ability to transfer property rights. If GMP wants to get property rights, there are mechanisms for them to get them. And with respect to the property rights, King County is not the gatekeeper, notwithstanding Council's representation and description of us as the gatekeeper. In this proceeding and in this transaction, the way the, the, way, um, the board approved the, the creation of the trail in this case, King County has two roles. One is that we are, in fact, the trail user. We have obligations as the trail user that we've agreed to in our statement of willingness to assume financial responsibility. And in all of the documents that we have filed and in all of the agreements that we have reached, we have been very clear um, that our, we have the obligations of trail user to be responsible for the line, to preserve it for reactivation of freight service, and that if freight, react, if freight service is reactivated, then we have to get out of the way. Our trail has to get out of the way. And the agreements that we have with King County, with the city of Redmond, uh, with Sound Transit, all make it very clear that anybody who does anything on this property has to understand that limitation with respect to whatever may happen on the property. The other role... At what, at what point do you... or uh City of Redmond or the Port of Seattle or whoever who has got the property rights now have a responsibility to reactivate service if there's sufficient demand by shippers and who would decide what level of demand would be sufficient that would activate the common carrier obligation to restore service? Well, the, the board, would, I was about to get to that. Thank you very much, Commissioner Moore, <clears throat> because the second part of what happened when this, when this trail was created was that King County acquired the reactivation right, but the board was very clear in the, in the decision where it said that King County was acquiring that there's a second way that somebody can come in. King County, as the holder of what would have been BNSF's reactivation right, could, if it wished to, restart service on this line, just the same as any abandoning railroad would be able to. But the board was very clear that in the event that a bona fide petitioner comes along, those are the board's words, in the event a bona fide petitioner comes along and seeks authorization to operate rail service and gets authorization to operate rail service, then then uh, rail service can re be reactivated. And the statute sets out the standards for that. We have Section 10901, Section 10902. The public convenience and necessity standard would mandate that if there's a ruling under that section that rail service has to commence, it would be rather difficult for the trail user not to, not to honor that finding. But that's not what we have here. What we have in this case, we don't have a request for independent new service under or new authorization under Section 10901 or 10902, what GNP has done is come to this board and ask for a transfer of our reactivation right. The, on, on page two of their initial pleading, they make it very clear that what they're seeking is the acquisition of the residual common carrier obligation. That's what King County acquired. That's not what's out there under Section 10902 for them to acquire. If they were to bring an application under 10901 or 10902, depending on whether they are, in fact, a, a rail carrier providing transportation subject to the jurisdiction of the board, uh, an allegation, an assertion that they make and with which we are certain that we agree. Um, if they were to get authorization under that, then the, the county would be hard-pressed to look at that and say, sorry, we're going to... We, we're gonna you would retain that. property rights, but they would be the operating railroad. We have no property rights. Uh, the, uh, the city of Redmond would have the pro property rights, and, uh, um, and the Port, Port of Seattle, Seattle yeah. has property rights, and, and I'm sure that Mr. Cohen, when he's here in a few minutes, will, will be eager to answer that question. And GMP would have to contract with them 
GNP would have to find a way to get access to the property in order to be able to conduct that. And that's what this board has consistently asked parties who are seeking to reactivate abandoned rail lines to do, and that is to come to the board with a package of rights available. That's what the Iowa Power case stands for. The board recently confirmed this idea that when you come to the board to reactivate an abandoned rail line, in the Mare Island case, when you come to the board to reactivate an abandoned rail line, you should come with the property rights that you need in order to be able to conduct the operation. And if you don't have the property rights, then we'll ask you to just wait, you, the board, will wait, will ask the parties to come back when they do have those property rights so that they can then go forward. And Iowa Power makes it pretty clear that a party that seeks to reactivate a rail service, if it's somebody other than the abandoning carrier, should have the regulatory authority that they need, should be able to restart service, and in the Iowa Power case, there's also an indication that they should get consent of the abandoning carrier. In the Iowa Power case, the abandoning carrier still held on to the reactivation right. It hadn't transferred it away, as has happened in this case. With respect to the proposal that GMP is making here, GMP has, Mr. Heffner has indicated that, and in response to questions from this board, has indicated that we don't really have any idea about what might be the right circumstances when we would permit a rail carrier to come back onto the property. And he makes much of the testimony in Ms. Bissonnette's deposition about that we don't do rail. Well, remember the timing of this transaction. Remember how this transaction played out. The parties spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how to structure this transaction in a way that was going to solve everybody's issues and bring everybody to a point where BNSF would be willing to abandon and relinquish the lines in the way that it did. The parties completed that, and at the time, the only rail carrier that was in the picture that might have some interest in operating anywhere close to these lines that were abandoned, that were abandoned and subject to trail use, had signed an agreement that would permit it to operate only on the northern section on what Mr. Heffner referred to as the freight segment. And indeed, that carrier had specifically agreed that it would not try to do anything further to the south. So is it the case that the county, at the time that Ms. Bissonnette was deposed, did not have staff in place, did not have a function in place to figure out how to do rail? Of course. This is a relatively new transaction for them, and they're in the process of trying to figure out how to manage their responsibilities. They're in the process of planning and implementing, developing and implementing the regional plan of which this transaction is a part and moving forward with that. And notwithstanding GNP's characterization of the county as standing in the way, the county is trying to figure out how to address its obligations. And as I indicated before, when the right carrier comes along and the board determines that such a carrier has satisfied the statutory standards, the county will satisfy its obligation. Mr. Spitalnik, could you move your mic up a little bit? I think people are having some. Thanks. I see that my time is almost up, and I want to confirm that this proceeding is not one in which GNP is simply coming before the board and asking for an exercise of authority under Section 10901 or 10902 to independently begin operation. It's asking for a transfer of our reactivation right. It's also brought this proceeding forward as an exemption proceeding, and this board's precedent is very clear that when a proceeding like this, when an application is one that engenders as much controversy as this application has, an exemption proceeding is not the appropriate way to go forward. Rather, it should be subject to a full application. And if this were to be subject to a full application, then GNP would be required to make the full showing that the public convenience and necessity mandates the reinstitution of rail service over this line. And based on the facts that you've heard presented today that have been developed in this proceeding, now I want to keep talking. I want people to hear me. And based on the facts that have been developed in this proceeding and that have been presented in all of our pleadings, it's not entirely clear that GNP would even be able to make the showing required under 10902. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. We'll next hear from counsel for the city of Redmond. Please step up, introduce yourself for the record, and begin. Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Commissioner Mulvey, I'm Matt Cohen, and I'm here on behalf of the city of Redmond, Washington. Redmond owns the southerly four miles of the Redmond Spur. The city purchased that segment from the Port of Seattle 
for $10 million cash about a year ago. The board asked the asked council to address the circumstances under which the board will grant a carrier's request to vacate a need to. I, I've never understood whether it's a need to or a night to, but uh, it'll be a need to for me today. When the carrier does not own or have any other interest in the right of way, I think the board's own rules address that uh, address that question. GNP filed a petition under 49 U.S.C. 10902 to acquire operating rights to the Redmond Spur. The board has some rules that uh, implement the requirements of 10902, and they require that a carrier proposing to acquire an operating interest in a short line submit, and I'm quoting, a statement that an agreement has been reached or details about when an agreement will be reached. GNP addressed this requirement in its petitions to the board. It says it's been talking with King County representatives. How, however, the parties have not yet reached an agreement. That statement was true last summer when GNP filed its petitions. It's true today. But, and, and so that's interesting, but the requirement is actually a requirement of your rules. It's a facial requirement when you file an application under 10902 mm, to have, have a statement that an agreement has been reached. The requirement has substantive roots. It's really the board saying to an entity that wants to acquire an operating interest in a rail line, come in here and show us that you have the ability to occupy the line, to provide service on the line. Show us a property right. Show us a contractual right. GMP has not satisfied that requirement, and that omission in and of itself, I think, is dispositive of their application. There's another huge legal problem with GNP's petition here, in our view, and that is that it would, if you, if you granted their petitions, you would really eviscerate the board's OFA authority. And the facts, the, the way in which this transaction unfolded is um, more powerful in showing that than any arguments I could make. In September of 2008, BNSF filed a notice of exemption to abandon service on the Woodenville subdivision and the Redmond Spur. <clears throat> that same month, the board published notice of the intended abandonment and invited expressions of interest to file an OFA. At that time, GNP was negotiating hard with the Port of Seattle for access to the Redmond Spur. They weren't seeking the ability to provide freight service. They were seeking the, the ability to provide excursion service. But one can presume that they were well aware of the abandonment application. In fact, the record is replete with uh, statements by them that indicate they knew what was they knew what BNSF was proposing to do, and yet they did not file any expression of interest to do an OFA. Neither did anyone else. And that's not surprising because there was no freight service on the line. There hadn't been for a few years. And there was no prospect for making money carrying freight on the Redmond Spur. So the board issued a need to order. And it took, uh, it took BNSF about a year to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement with the Port of Seattle. But the, uh, the property was transferred to the port in December 2009, transferred rail banked rights of way for $81 million. King County became the interim trail manager at that time. So hardly is the ink dry on that purchase and sale agreement when GNP comes into the board with its current petitions and says, why don't you allow us to assume the operating responsibility on the Redmond Spur mm, without paying anything? If they had filed an OFA, they would have had to make a showing of their financial responsibility, and they would have been had to have been willing to pay fair market value for the line. Mm. If you allow them to skip over the statutory procedure established by Congress that enables a third party to come in and save a failing rail line at the time of abandonment, <clears throat> 
and then wait until those proceedings are over and somebody has paid $80 million for the line and then come in and do what they're proposing to do here, what's left of your OFA authority? Why would anyone ever invoke those procedures if you can do what GNP is proposing to do now? GNP says it's a state law issue. We know that we need to obtain property rights on the Redmond Spur, but that shouldn't be the board's concern. That's an issue for the state courts. But it's not a state law issue where a carrier files a facially incomplete application. The showing that they have that right to access the right-of-way is one of your 10902 requirements. It's also a board issue when a carrier invokes STB authority to accomplish purposes other than providing interstate rail freight service. We think that's what's happening here. GNP's goals are to run an excursion train from downtown Redmond to the city of Snohomish and ultimately to force Sound Transit to buy them out when Sound Transit does its East Link light rail system when it comes to Redmond. You don't have to look very far to find the evidentiary basis for those contentions. Start with that contract that several of you asked about. The contract forbids GNP from carrying freight on the Redmond Spur. GNP negotiated that contract with an eye to their business plan for this right-of-way. They knew very well when they entered into it what it said, and they accepted that provision. If you're planning to run freight, you're not going to sign a contract that says you can't. And that contract is very consistent with the representations that GNP made to the Port of Seattle when they were seeking authority to acquire interest in the Woodinville subdivision and the Redmond Spur. GNP said, you can't make money hauling freight on this right-of-way. Excursion service is what we want. Eighty percent of our revenues are going to come from excursion. And when the Port declined to grant them those rights, GNP said, well, then we're going to have to change the economic terms of the deal. Instead of paying you $1 million up front, we'll pay you $10,000 up front. And for various reasons that are outside the scope of this proceeding, the Port went along with that. And the final agreement forbids GNP from running freight on the Redmond Spur. So GNP next went to the Redmond City Council and painted a lovely picture of an excursion service from downtown Redmond up to Snohomish. They were going to call it the tasting train. And they were going to run cruise ship passengers from Redmond up to Snohomish, and they'd all have a wonderful time. And they might all have a wonderful time, but Redmond had other priorities for this right-of-way and declined that invitation. And so the next thing, GNP files its petition seeking to invoke your authority to reestablish freight service. You said Redmond had other plans for the right-of-way. What are those plans? All of those plans? Well, the short-term plans are a trail and a stormwater trunk line to be installed this summer unless the Board enjoins them from doing so. Is the stormwater trunk line incompatible with the rail bank line, or can they both be done? The stormwater trunk line was engineered and engineered very consciously to permit reinstitution of rail service in the future if that demand materializes. So it will go under a section of the right-of-way, but it requires the salvage of seven-tenths of a mile of the right-of-way in order to install the line, you know, 12 feet underground. But it was engineered to permit restoration of rail service if that demand materialized. In the long term, that same mile of the Redmond Spur running through downtown Redmond is the last mile of the East Link light rail system that Sound Transit is trying to build out to Redmond from downtown Seattle. There's some issue about whether or not the construction season will pass if the Board delays it. We're familiar with construction seasons, and I'm familiar with the Seattle area. It's raining most of the time. Is the construction season really going to end in October, or can the work actually be done even later because you don't get a lot of snow and things? You never know when the rain is going to start. 
in the Pacific Northwest, but the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife just says we don't allow construction except during that summer window. Okay, so thank you. that's when it can happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Mr. Savage, I believe, uh, you have five minutes on rebuttal. Mr. Chairman, uh, Redmond had failed to do environmental due diligence in connection with this supposedly essential trunk line. Uh, in fact, it was not until after we filed our motion uh, to strike their April 13th filing that they even made initial contact with either of the environmental agencies that they were required to do uh, by this board when it entered the uh, King County uh, trail use uh, decision, the decision allowing King County to uh, become the trail user. Mr. Uh, Savage, do you know anything more about this um, uh, bankruptcy proceeding and, and I, I guess the status of uh, GNP with respect to this 50% ownership that appears to be uh, not with us today? Um, yes, you, yes. Yeah, do you, can you, can you explain ex exactly where we're at? I mean, has GMP done everything they need to as, as a, as a corporation to go ahead with this transaction that they're proposing? Yes, uh, GNP has, uh, done their due diligence. Uh, first of all, with regard to the bankruptcy, the involuntary bankruptcy petition, uh, was filed by some creditors pursuant to the bankruptcy court's process. Uh, the parties are in negotiations. Uh, it's a two-step negotiation. The first negotiation is GNP and its uh, potential financiers. Uh, there are flights of financiers lined up one after the other for the right to fund this pro process. Uh, we are at a point in time where that has not been finalized. Once that is finalized, and it shall be finalized, by May 25th, which is the date set down by the bankruptcy court for the finalization of GNP funding. Uh, GNP will meet with the creditors and will work out a plan for paying them presumably 100 cents on the dollar, which will result in the dismissal of the bankruptcy proceeding. Uh, with regard to the corporate ownership of GNP, uh, Mr. Engel was speaking uh, in two capacities. Number one, he is a shareholder, and number two, he was a corporate officer. Uh, he n is no longer a corporate officer. I would state that as a matter of common sense, Mr. Engel's shareholdings would be worth zero if GNP were to be adjudged a bankrupt, which they have not as of yet been so adjudged. Uh, and that it was, is in Mr. Engel's interests, as it is in the interests of the other shareholders, for GNP to go forward. Uh, and under the very specific railroad bankruptcy provisions, uh, there is no possibility of Mr. Engel benefiting as a current shareholder of GNP by the implosion of GNP. But at the present time, Mr. Engel is not on board. Is that what you're saying? Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel is allowed under the terms of GNP's corporate uh, provisions to participate in the decision approving the financing. Should he uh, choose not to participate, or to oppose the financing, then he would lose his entire investment. So he has not, to this point... What, what is that investment, do you know? I believe it's it's in the six-figure range. And there are also family members who have... In, uh, his family members have also invested additional monies. So it's not an insubstantial amount of money that is in um, the process of being worked through. Well, this is a money issue. If the board were to permit GNP to reactivate rail service on this line, how would GNP compensate the owner of the property uh, for its use? How would you compensate the Port of Seattle or uh, City of Redmond? Uh, the well, monies that were talked about here were in the millions of dollars, and you're not filing an OFA, 
And that's another concern. Uh, is this a, an attempt at getting around the board's OFA process and requirements? And we do require that those people filing an OFA are financially uh, viable, and uh, we do look at that very, very carefully to make sure that an OFA uh, filing is from a legitimate filer. So how would you, um, could you address both of those, why it's not an end run around our OFA process and how you would determine compensation? Should the board be determining what the compensation should be? No. GMP has a compensation arrangement in place with the port for the freight easement. The port is the owner of the first 3.4 miles of the Redmond Spur. Should we be granted operating authority, which this board can grant under 10502, the Prairie Central decision, even in the absence of our showing of, an, of a present ability to consummate the transaction, uh, GMP expects that it would enter into a similar arrangement with the port with regard to the balance of the line, some of which trackage it already operates uh, various, uh, it has already various rights to operate on. With regard to Redmond, we're not sure. And uh, Redmond was not disclosed as an owner of the property to us until after this proceeding had already begun. I'm, I appreciate their stepping forward, but they present issues which are of a different, different nature. And we have some uh, ideas on how to satisfy their interests as well, which we'd be happy to share with the board should you wish to extend me the time or perhaps through a further submission after this hearing. Could you just re remind the board what the terms are with respect to the contract to not provide freight service when you entered into it, how long that contract goes for? The contract with the Port of Seattle, I believe, is for 10 years, Mr. Payne. And, and when was it? Remind me when it was entered December into? December 2009. And you filed with the board just last August? 2010. And under Eight the... Eight months later. Right. But I would... I know we're going into issues of state law, which... But well, it's actually, if you're not going to... True. But my question is if the company at the time, the carrier envisioned in December 2009 that it wasn't providing freight service for 10 years. Uh, it in was, only eight months right. you filed to, I'm just kind of trying to understand. I can, uh, yes, I, I will explain. Uh, the contract with the Port of Seattle was made subject to the multi-purpose easement, and the uh, multi-purpose easement requires the county to cooperate in the restoration of freight service. So there are provisions that giveth and provisions that taketh within the same document, hence the state court dilemma that needs to be resolved. I don't find that to be very clear. I'm sorry. Uh, the, multi, the public multipurpose easement uh, is in the record, and it does require the uh, county to cooperate with the party seeking to reactivate freight service, which happens in this case to be GNP. Well, it, it's still an issue, though. A uh, question: Why you signed an agreement that said you can't, you would not operate freight service uh, over this line, and then fairly shortly afterwards, and recognizing that that was in your longer term interest if you're going to reactivate the line uh, for freight service, and you're going to have to be carrying. I mean. Why was why did you sign it to begin with? Uh, I just don't quite understand why you, you would, they would have gone ahead and signed it when it uh, well, the, clearly was the, opposed to its purpose, purpose. Once the line was up and running, business opportunities arose for GNP that also contemplated additional business on the contiguous branch down the Redmond Spur. And you, the board does have letters of interest from various parties on the spur. So those all occurred and only developed after you had already signed that. that That's that correct, agreement. Commissioner. Has there been any contact with like, the, with Seattle or th those that you entered the contract with to try to undo the contract? Well, we had um, sought a meeting with the stakeholders under the board's auspices, uh, under a mediation or negotiation format supervised by the board, and I believe that Seattle had, or excuse me, that King County had agreed to participate in, in that meeting, but then the bankruptcy 
petition arose and uh, put a, a stop for the present on those discussions. But we would like to renew, resume them as soon as the bankruptcy is behind us. To a large degree, the whole idea of the Rails to Trails program was to preserve the rights of way for the reactive, reactivation of rail service. And I think the focus really was on freight, although we have approved it to be used for, for passenger services as well. But um, the um, other speakers suggested that what you want to do is run this uh, cruise ship train and, and uh, to, the, to the port and with, uh, I guess, a wine train or whatever. Um, <clears throat> would it be possible for the uh, board to, do you feel the board has the authority to limit reactivation of the line to uh, carry freight service only? That it would have to carry freight service. It would not just be reactivated for the purpose of carrying uh, this uh, this tour train, this charter train. Yes, and cutting through the fog of war, we have a plan that would keep freight trains out of downtown Redmond. That we are anxious to present the, to them if we can get beyond the point, the stalemate that we are at right now. Well, we could we could condition the authority on saying, but you must be carrying freight train freight service over this, not just the. Uh, not just uh, passengers. Passengers actually are something that the community does not oppose in principle. Mm -hmm. After all, they are doing a study of their own with regard to, to providing trolley service up the line from Redmond towards our Woodenville sound segment. So, sound service. And it's, it's, well, that's in addition. This is a Redmond-specific trolley okay. study that was commissioned by the town. Uh, in the recent months. In addition to that, Sound Transit wants to get to Redmond by a back door that w that kind of essentially sets up an end-to-end -end operation where our line or the spur ends in Redmond, Sound Transit builds out from Bellevue and, and connects to Redmond from the southeast. So all of these proposed uses are compatible. Uh, we don't think that the it's the excursion business that detracts or, or causes Redmond to have these concerns about our operation because they know that the wineries on the spur are tourist destinations. There, there have been attempts to operate tourist trains on the, the line before, and um, we think that our proposal doesn't do violence to any of Redmond's interests. Uh, I, we thought, and perhaps we, we believe correctly that they don't want freight trains downtown. We can keep the freight trains w uh, west of the river that separates the spur from downtown should we be granted authority to do so by the board. Would, would you mind repeating, I think you said that prior to the bankruptcy issue that you had hoped to mediate or negotiate. Is, could uh, you just clarify what you said? We had contacted the STB with a suggestion that the parties conduct or have a meeting, um, I guess, uh, mediated to some extent, I don't know whether formally or informally, by the board's office of public assistance. The board had approved that, and I believe the other parties had not opposed it. And in fact, I think we had one letter, and I believe it was from Mr. Spitalnik's client indicating that they consented to it. Then the bankruptcy happened, and we were stopped in our tracks, and that meeting has not taken place. And we, we had actually asked for a stay of this proceeding to get the bankruptcy resolved. But um, in any event, it will be one way or the other by May 25th. Prior to your filing last year with the board, had there been any efforts to have conversations with King County or the Port or Redmond? I think you said actually you didn't know Redmond was participating, but or did you just sort of Redmond. surprise every? I mean, is, to discuss the issue of the property rights, which yes, that subject came up. The negotiations were ongoing uh, between GNP and I believe Te Yoshitani Yoshitani of Port of Seattle. He was. Uh, spearheading those discussions, and I believe King County was also a party to them. So there have been, there were discussions up until the point of filing, and they took a front to our filing, and there was kind of a cold war. Can you setting. sort of describe the extent? I mean, were there 
countless meetings? Was there one phone call? What, multiple what meetings. Had gone multiple through? meetings, and there is an email. Uh, I, we have exchanged emails with the other parties, copies of the files reflecting the results of those meetings. Uh, we did not attach them to the record, uh, but we have them in our files, as do the other side. Does the other side? Could you just kind of share what the, maybe the, the timeline duration was? I believe that the, the position of the port was that they needed more time to study the ramifications and implications of it all, which we didn't really understand because we already had an agreement with them for the freight e segment, and this was just an accessory use, so to speak, to use a land use term, to extend our franchise a few miles down the track. So we didn't know why they needed so much time. And we decided to accelerate the process by filing. They took a front to that, and we didn't talk for for several months. Hence my suggestion that we have the uh, informal meetings using the board's Office of Public Assistance as a facilitator to get those started again. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Uh, thank you all, Council, uh, for your thoughtful arguments. We'll take the matter under advisement, and the meeting of the board is now adjourned. Thank you. <clears throat>